So far, so good? Okay, so we've talked a lot about theoretical stuff, and I want to mention some engineering application to this, and we'll come back to this example very shortly again. It's actually one of the things I did in my undergrad was um, using this technique called magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Has anybody heard of that technique? I see a nod, so. Okay, um, okay. Um, any, any buzzwords you want to throw out? Anything that you think it means? Yes? Yep. So that, that's a specific type of MRS, hyperpolarized, what they do here at Stanford too. Um, so think of NMR on an MRI image. That's what MRS is. So you can, for each voxel, you can do an NMR. Okay, so which means that you have the chemical constitution of everything in that voxel. Right. That's what MRS is. It's done, it can be done in humans, in vivo, right? Which is really cool. And it's used traditionally, you, would, you don't give radioactive substances in the case of MR, you give sort of um, substances which have this quantum property called spin, and carbon-13 is something which is used which is not radioactive, for example often, and what you'll do is you'll take a substrate for metabolism, say acetate or glucose or something, and that's labeled with C13 at a specific position, and then you'll just have basically an infusion of that constantly going in, and then you know that glucose, acetate, etc., these participate in various biochemical cycles in the body, right, the TCA cycle, you know, the, you know all sorts of biochemical cycles in the body, and so you would expect that when, say, something is getting metabolized to, through the TCA cycle, you would see enrichment of the TCA cycle intermediates, right, the metabolites in, involved in the TCA cycle to get more and more C13 over time. And you can actually measure that, those C13 curves. And from that, you can derive how fast is the TCA cycle in this human being. Pretty amazing, right? This is a very cellular measurement that you're getting from MR. And you can do this in humans. You can actually measure the rate of the TCA cycle and a lot of other different biochemical processes. A lot of metabolism has been worked out through MRS, right? It has, I mean, it has, of course, limitations in terms of the sensitivity not being good, so on. But why is this related to sort of simulating data with noise? It's related because, um, so once you get these time courses from MR spectra, you can imagine a lot of NMR spectra, you get sort of labeling over time of, with 13C, then, you actually make a metabolic model. And you, by the end of this class, you'll be actually able to make such models where you basically have equations describing the TCS cycle and the flux of this 13C substrate, right? And then you fit it to the data you're getting, right? And then you get those TCS cycle parameters and other biochemical parameters, right? And where simulation of data comes in, so once you've obtained your fit, you have an estimate of the standard deviation in your data Right? And then you'll just keep adding that standard deviation to your data maybe like 500 times and 1,000 times and repeat parameter estimation every single time, right? And so you use these tools to do that, and then you'll have like a histogram of your parameter values, which will tell you whether your technique, whether you're being able to reliably and precisely measure your parameters. That did not make any sense at all, did it? No? Okay, we're gonna try again. So. Is everybody with me as far as the gist of MRS is concerned in terms of what this technique is doing? That you're getting 13C labeling curves for various intermediates in the TCA cycle. You've learned these intermediates like citrate, alpha-ketoglutarate, glutamate, all these succinate. You've learned these different intermediates, right? And so you can imagine that you have sort of kinetics of these different intermediates, right? And the kinetics, the time courses of these different intermediates would tell you how fast the TCA cycle is running, right? If the TCA cycle is running extremely fast, labeling would be extremely fast. If the TCA cycle is running slowly, labeling would be slower, right? So it should make intuitive sense that by doing fitting of the experimental data, we can actually get the rates, these rates. And we'll be doing that in this class to some degree. So what I'm saying now is that apart from estimating the rates from an experimental time course, it is important, right, to be able to say, how precisely do I know this metabolic rate? 
Right? You want to know the sensitivity of your parameter. You want to know if just one data point was to be switched around, whether your met metabolic rate would be like three times what you've estimated it to be. That's a bad thing, right? Right? It shouldn't be very sensitive. And so the way you do that is once you've fitted your experimental time course, then you just go in and pretty much just add Gaussian noise to it separately in a lot of different iterations. And once you've done, and each time you add that noise to it, you estimate the parameters again. So you get different values for their parameters. So if you've done 1,000 different separate individual additions of random noise, you'll get 1,000 different parameter values each time. And then you can make a histogram of that and calculate what the spread in that parameter is, which can tell you, oh, actually I'm not at all sensitive to measuring that parameter, for example. And so my value for this parameter that I've estimated from this data set doesn't mean anything, right? And so that's how, and that's one of the applications where simulation of data with noise is important in the biomedical engineering realm. That made a little bit more sense. Okay? Okay? So, so, so it's about, again, sensitivities of estimated parameters. You can get that from simulation. So moving on, um, OD solvers, any questions? Any questions? So, so what you do is basically, so you have, the question was, where does this data come from, right? So you're basically able to, I'm not gonna get too much in the details, but you design pulse sequences in MR where you're literally doing, as I mentioned before, like, so you define, say I want to measure the liver, the liver's here, I define an image area in the liver that I'm interested in, then corresponding to each voxel, I can actually acquire some, what, something similar to an NMR spectrum. I average them spatially, right? And then I have this massive, spectrum, and over time, if you look at, say, the peak for some intermediate that you're interested in, that peak would keep going up and up in the spectrum, right? And so you measure, you can measure the peak area, you can measure the peak height, or something like that, and then you can actually just make a plot. And then you do fitting to that plot. I'll actually share with you my code for one of my data cycle model, we'll talk about the ODE that you'll see what sort of these equations look like. Pretty cool though, right, in terms of being able to determine like these very cellular parameters from such like a bulk experiment on like an actual human. That's very rare that you can get such parameters from humans. And so you can imagine the applications of that, right, to diabetes, to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, to studying exercise, how exercise affects us, right, all sorts of metabolism problems which might be otherwise very complicated. 